everyone. This is Matthew from Adventure Arkansas. Um, today I'm going to be doing a video about the drag torque and drag power on a free hub. Let's get started. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is taking the free hub off the bike. Um, so you want to take your wheel off and then um, on my bike in particular you can actually take these off without taking the cassette off. So it just pops off, just pull very lightly. And make sure that your stuff doesn't go everywhere. You can see the internals right there. Um, so next I want to talk about how we're actually going to be measuring the torque on this free hub. So we're going to be using a couple different formulas to find the drag torque and the drag power measured at the hub. So the first one we're going to go through is the drag torque. So the torque is measured as the force times the distance. So in this case, the distance is the distance from the center line of the hub to the area where the poles and the steel drive ring are interfering. So that's really easy to measure. Um, we'll go through that here in a second. Um, but one thing that we will need to measure is the force required to compress the spring. So that's shown in the second equation, F equals K times X. So we know the, um, we can measure the distance that the spring is able to compress. We can also measure the, um, the K value. Um, we don't really need to find this, but it's also interesting to see what the K value is for springs that these, this small. Um, so to, to be able to find the force, we're actually gonna use a trick um, and just average them out. I don't have a very precise scale, um, but we will be able to use an average to be able to get a reasonable answer. Um, the next thing that we're going to be doing is finding the drag power. So power equals force times velocity. So the force, the average force exerted on the hub, we'll find from above. Um, and then the velocity is the linear velocity at the steel drive ring distance. And that's found um, from the wheel rotational speed, AKA, you can find that from how fast you're going. Um, for our example, we're gonna be measuring at 10, 15, and 20 miles per hour to simulate downhill speeds. So the first thing that we're gonna be measuring is the diameter of the outer drive ring. So I've got my pair of calipers here. I'm just gonna use this, bring it out like so. We'll get a nice average reading of 40.5 millimeters, 40.51 40 millimeters. Um, so we'll go ahead and record that and then divide that by two to get the radius. So now that we have the distance small d at 20.25 millimeters, the next thing we want to do is find the average spring force. And to do that, we're going to take the springs out Place, this on, place them on the scale here, and then use a hard um, surface that's flat. Um, you can use like a plate or anything like that. I just got this uh, letter opener since it's plastic and fairly hard. We'll put them under there and press it down and measure with the scale to see what force it takes to compress all six springs, and then divide that by six to get our average force. Now that we have the springs out, I'm going to go ahead and measure their compression distance. Um, so if you can see here, they're right at 4.11 millimeters, uh, really small springs. And then I'm just going to take the caliper set. So I had a bit of bad luck. Um, when I was compressing that last spring, it kind of jumped out and I'm in my backyard right now, so it's gone forever. I'll have to um, order another one. Um, but as you can see, the compressed length is 1.52 millimeters. Um, so we're going to use that to calculate the K factor. Okay, so now to measure the force, I've got all five of my springs standing up. We're going to open our scale. We have it in metric units. So we're going to be measuring in grams. Okay, so it's fairly balanced. Um, so you can see that it's already at 9 grams. 
that's how heavy that little card is. And over here, we'll be able to see how compressed it gets. So, right about there is where all of them are compressed. And I'm measuring about 700 grams. We'll, we'll just call it 700 to make it even. So with that 700 grams, let's go ahead, go ahead over here. So we'll say the force total equals 700 grams. And we're gonna multiply that by 1,000 thousand grams, one kg. Um, and then multiply that by 1 kg to 9.8 newtons. Um, for everyone that hasn't taken physics and stuff like that, um, this is just a quick conversion to get a weight. So this 700 grams is in a weight similar to pounds. And we're going to transform it into a force, which is measured in newtons in the metric system. So we'll go ahead and um, I'll get my calculator out and do that real quick. So whenever you do all the math, multiply everything out, you get 6.86 newtons for all five springs. And if you divide that by five, you get 1.39 newtons per spring to do a full compression. So I thought about my math a little bit more um, and I'm going to continue with this video with a few assumptions. So the first one is gonna be that all the force that we put on the spring to compress this pole into it um, is going to be lost whenever that spring returns to um, uncompressed. So essentially what that's saying is that all the force that we're putting in to compress this is lost because whenever the spring returns and the pole returns, it doesn't give anything back to us. It just slams into place and it doesn't gain us any net uh, forward motion. So that's my first assumption. Um, that means that all this crap down here with angles and stuff doesn't really matter um, because we're just gonna be using the spring force and then multiplying it by that distance. One other thing that I found was if you look up here at the uh, spring force equation, you can see that we got a K value of 0.53 Newtons per millimeter, um, which is actually a lot stronger than I thought it would be. So now we're gonna go through our exercise of finding the drag torque. So we already know FS from below, and we've already measured D, this small D here, this radius. Um, so now with both of those, we can multiply them together and find our drag torque. And then we'll also go through the exercise to find the drag power. Okay, so let's go through some of this math here. Um, so first thing that we have is we're going to find our hub torque. Um, so we're just going to use F times D. So from earlier, the, the pole force exerted on the drive ring is the spring force times 6, which equals 8.22 newtons. Um, and then from earlier, we've measured the um, radius of the drive ring at 20.25 millimeters, or 0 0.02025 meters. So our torque is going to be the force times the distance, and it equals 0.166 newton meters of torque. And that's just from the springs, um, or about 0.122 pound foot of torque. Um, that's pretty much nothing. Um, you can kind of figure it out. Um, if you had a one foot long wrench and you put down 0.12, pound force of force, you would get this number. So next, let's look at the power. So to calculate power, we're going to use the formula power equals force times velocity. From earlier, we have the spring force equal to 8.22 newtons. Um, and then I measured my wheel at a 28 inch diameter. Um, it's a 27.5 by 2.6 inch wheel. It, notice that this actually will change for 26 versus 29. 29 inch wheels are gonna be a lot larger. 
um, and thus have less rotations per second. So they'll, they'll actually experience less drag force from a free will hub. That's just an interesting note. Um, so what I've done is I've converted the 28 inch diameter wheel divided by two to get a 14 inch radius and then um, change that to feet. So the formula we're using is the rotational speed in radians per second is equal to the linear velocity divided by the radius that you're observing. So at these different speeds, we have a different linear foot per second at the wheel. So that's what speed the very edge of your wheel is rotating at. Um, and then I've converted those to radians per second. You can see the math right there. So next we're gonna go down and just measure the, um, the linear velocity at the steel drive ring in the hub. So we're gonna use that same formula, just uh, arrange differently. Um, excuse my cat in the background. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna see that the linear velocity at 10 miles an hour at the hub is 0.255 meters per second. And we're able to do this because radians per second is a non-dimensioned unit. Um, so I've converted that for all of our velocities. So now bringing back the, uh, the power figure, um, we're going to look at the power loss at 10 miles an hour. So that's our power, or excuse me, our force of 8.22 newtons times our linear velocity at the drive ring of 0.255 meters per second. That equals 2.1 watts. Calculated again for 15 and 20. So what about friction? Um, so I actually thought about this as well. Um, we didn't account for any friction in the system between um, any of the components. Um, so I went and looked at the coefficient of kinetic friction between steel and steel um, with lubrication and it's estimated to be at 0.16. That's, that's pretty normal. Um, with tool steel like this, it's super hard and we're using a light oil instead of like a traditional grease. It's most likely lower than this, um, but we'll look at this anyways. Um, so the frictional force is very simple. It's mu, which is this uh, coefficient of friction times Fn. Um, so what that equates to is it's about 16% more because remember whenever we calculated power, it's just the force um, times the velocity. So if you just add an extra 0.16 times this Fn is actually just the spring force in our case. Well, not really, but it's within like two and a half percent error. Um, and when you're dealing with numbers this small, it doesn't really matter as much. So if you look at the difference, the um, the most notable one is that your friction at 20 miles an hour, so that's like a you know ride down Whistler um, a line. You're going to be picking up five watts of of drag. And if you compare that to um, what this hub was stock with only three poles, it's only two and a half. Two and a half watts you're losing by adding your engagement. So yes, it actually is a noticeable difference. Um, but again, it scales with speed and it's not as noticeable as you think. So unfortunately, I was not able to find a good example of how much power five, watt, five watts actually feels like. Um, the easiest way that I can explain 5 watts is, I mean, it's literally like pushing your bike at like 2 or 3 miles an hour. Um, so th the difference between 2.5 and, and 5 watts of loss going downhill is not really going to be felt, in my opinion. Um, maybe if you're going downhill like racing, 35, 40 miles an hour on really long stretches, I could definitely see where it would be more beneficial to have a hub that isn't as lossy, um, especially since you don't really need the high engagement as much. Um, so real, realistically, who's this, um, who's this modification for? It's for someone that wants to have higher points of engagement, obviously, um, and that's for tricky technical sections. Um, so whenever you put your, your foot down, put your pedal down, you want that power engagement to be immediate, to be direct. And that's what this is all about. Um, ideally, you will not be coasting at, you know, 10, 20 miles an hour. 
Um, but if you do, you're only going to notice a power loss of around two and a half watts. Now, for most people, that doesn't really matter as much. Um, if you're racing, obviously that's kind of bad. Um, but you got to weigh your pros and cons. Um, but I did the math, and it's really not that much of a loss, especially when you compare it to um, what you're achieving with this with this modification. So. There are the numbers. Um, yeah, feel free to, to let me know if I if you think that I did any of my, of my math incorrectly. Um, if you have any suggestions, anything like that, um, I'd love to give comments and uh, maybe do a follow-up video or something. Thanks for watching. See you later.